Hi, everybody, and thank you so much for tuning in to this production of Anonymous at Wayne State University with Theater and Dance at Wayne. My name is Emily. I am one of the theater management master's students at Wayne State, and I was the marketing and audience engagement director for Anonymous. We assembled this panel to help all of you think more deeply about the themes that occurred in the show and help think about how they apply to Michigan right now. So um, we have some great panelists here. They're gonna help guide this conversation and really help everyone think deeply. And I'm gonna let them introduce themselves now. Hello, my name is Kelly Crump. She, her, hers. I'm the director of Anonymous. And a um, little bit about me. I have a master's of fine arts and acting from the National Theater Conservatory at the Denver Center for Performing Arts. And I'm a member of AEA, the Actors' Equity Association, and a member of SAG-AFTRA, Screen Actors Guild, and American Federation of Television and Radio Artists. Thank you, Kelly. And I'm, I'm Mary Anderson. I'm the chair of theater and dance and I uh, just want to take a moment to congratulate the cast, the crew, the ensemble, the greater team of humans that all contributed to this amazing production. It, incredibly moving, incredibly beautiful, incredibly artistic. So thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Emily. And thanks to everyone who was part of this creative team. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lauren Duquette Rory. I'm an associate professor of sociology here at Wayne State. Um, really thrilled to be here and to learn from this production uh, and to you know discuss important topics that face Michigan and the United States and every other destination country in the world near and far. Um, my work looks mostly at um, international migration and my first book looks at remittances and how remittances affect the homeland, uh, everything from potable drinking water and electricity to shaping democracy and uh, citizen voice. And my current book project looks at how interior immigration enforcement affects the prospects for citizenship and political integration. So I'm excited. Uh, I saw some of these themes resonate uh, in the play and um, I'm so, so excited to be here and to chat with all of you. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Shri Tanidar. I am a lawmaker. I'm a state representative in the House, Michigan House. I am uh, a scientist, a PhD chemist. And uh, for 25 years, I have been a serial entrepreneur. So I have done a little bit of different things. But uh, being an immigrant, I really enjoyed the show. And I want to congratulate uh, Kelly and Emily and the entire cast for doing such a wonderful performance in a very difficult subject. So thank you. And I enjoyed thoroughly. Hello, my name is Sabrina Balgamoa. I am an assistant <laughs> clinical professor of law at Wayne State. And I have the privilege of directing the Asylum and Immigration Law Clinic, where law students have the opportunity to represent mm -hmm. asylum seekers and other people facing deportation in their proceedings. Amazing, thank you all. And thank you all again for joining us. Um, to get us started, um, Mary, can you speak to um, why Anonymous was chosen for this season at Theater and Dance at Wayne? Sure. I, I was thinking about this and um, it actually goes to uh, just a little bit over a year ago. Um, uh, there's a performance group called the uh, the Actors Gang Ensemble and they're based in Los Angeles and they were going to tour to Detroit uh, with a performance called The New Colossus and it's 12 actors telling their own ancestors immigration stories in 12 different languages. And we were so excited. This was February of 2020, and uh, and 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 we were going to bring students to go see it. And uh, the performance ended up getting canceled because not enough tickets were sold. And I thought, wow, it's fascinating. This I was more excited about that show than almost anything else that was coming through Detroit. How could it not be selling tickets? <laughs> this is such a timely story and so beautifully told. Uh, and, and so that sort of that opportunity came and then disappeared. And then just right after it, um, the pandemic really settled into Michigan and just changed our lives in so many different ways. And with that change came a complete reimagining 
of the 2021 uh, pr production season. And the faculty came together and they spent the entire summer trying to figure out what were we going to do given the the vast unknown we didn't know as you know we didn't know if the, the theaters were going to open in september or december or april we we just didn't know so what could we do what were the stories that we wanted to tell what was the urgent thing that needed to be done um and how could we bring our art in these most unusual times to these most important questions. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the performance faculty early on suggested the playwright Naomi Izuka, and we we're all very, just very excited about her work in general. And then they landed on the story of Anonymous and it just, it just clicked. Everybody just said, yes, it was this, it had to be this because it spoke so much, not just to these urgent questions around immigration, but around the moment that we're all living through. These questions about who are we and where have we come from and where are we going and um, the experiences of, 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 of displacement. So it just felt like the right thing to do. And um, and Kelly Crump was immediately suggested as as the woman, the artist, the the, the force of nature who could bring all, you know all of her expertise to this and so um, Kelly immediately stepped in and I'll let her her speak more about that but it, it has been an extraordinary journey um from from the very beginning and uh and 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 we are incredibly impressed with the with the artistry and the sensitivity that the students have brought and the depth that they've brought and the medium of film we didn't know that this was going to be a film when we when we started, but the medium of film has served the storytelling in a very particular way. Thank you, Mary. Um, so actually, Kelly, jumping over to you. Um, so Anonymous is theater for young audiences. So in order to cover the diff difficult topics of immigration, um, the author Naomi Izuka had to make some maybe changes to how things were talked about but also keep the fundamentals of the issue the same but in a way that could be you know presented to a younger audience so i wanted to hear from you about your thoughts on how immigration is portrayed in the show i think um at the time that uh, i was presented to direct this and this came into my universe um i was feeling very overwhelmed with everything that started to happen last summer, um, the rebellions that began to happen all across the globe, um, and feeling that I wish I could do something with all of this as a creative, uh, as a member of the global majority, uh, as a BIPOC person. Um, and this beautiful gift came and landed in my lap. And as I started to do more research on the topic, um, I began getting even more overwhelmed, and, but then also feeling angry um, and wanting to be active um, because of that feeling of helplessness uh, between watching the news all day, every day, seeing the horrific things that our government was doing to innocent people um, who were just, seeking a better life like many mm -hmm. others, um, as well as the treatment of homegrown born citizens at the hands of our government um, as we're watching the trial now. Um, I, in reading the script and being familiar with Homer's Odyssey, um, which mm -hmm. it's, it's based on, um, I was moved and very impressed at the compassion and humanity uh, with which Naomi wrote this story. Um, I think she was able to create a world that is kind of a, an in-between, uh, in-between realism and magical realism, uh, where we can morph <laughs> places and locations, which I feel speaks to the roller coaster ride that is dealing with these things, right? Dealing with these things of um, human trafficking, of sweatshops, of, you know, uh, gender roles and what is considered what the, the man of the house does, what the woman does, um, what our role in society is. Um, and I think 
in her writing and the way that she wrote this story and crafted this story, you can't help but feel um, <clears throat> encouraged to be more active in writing these wrongs and mm -hmm. into creating and finding your own voice in it. Um, and so I found that a lot of our students, a lot of our cast, I didn't have to do a lot with them. Like they wanted to research more. They wanted to Google search and, you know, we did everything remotely, um, but they, I didn't have to push them. It wasn't homework. It's, uh, she wrote this in a way that from, you know, eight years old to 80, everyone can understand this journey and everyone can understand what's right and what's wrong. And you can start to form your own opinions of it. Um, and so, yeah, I'm just, I, I thought she, she wrote this with great compassion and humanity, something that um, was, is, but really was greatly lacking um, in how our government uh, was treating others. Um, and mostly BIPOC looking others. I mean, didn't see any Canadians in, uh, th in these camps. Didn't see, you know what I mean? So mm, I won't go any further, but you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And especially for a topic that is um, e hard to talk about even with older children, it's important to be able to um, present it to them young because you want to be, may help them, you know, develop opinions early that you know, and and more understanding. And, and I think kids now, they get it because I think the next generations, they come from multiracial families. They they come from mixed marriages and they don't understand why why wouldn't we let people in? Why, why wouldn't we? It, it doesn't make sense. So um, I, I, I think she did, uh, Naomi did an amazing job of, um, as, as I said earlier or before, speaking up, teaching up to children, not down, not dumbing this topic down, um, so much mm -hmm. so that we could, we were able to turn it into a film that anyone could watch, you know, mm -hmm. and it did not feel like um, necessarily a PBS special for itty bitties. Um, but you know, yeah, toddlers. it could be, we looked into it. We, we were looking at puppets, um, and <laughs> cartoon trying to find interesting ways of telling the story, but we, we landed on this and I'm so happy, uh, with the craftsmanship and the art that Naomi helped inspire. Absolutely. Um, and then Representative Thanadar, one of the reasons that we were excited to be able to speak with you in this panel is that um, you have personal experience with immigration in addition to being familiar with the policy side of things. So can you speak to your personal immigration story and then also how um, this production of Anonymous, where you see similarities or differences or whatever inspires you in that area? Sure. Uh, first of all, congratulations to the cast and uh, uh, directors and writers, great job. Uh, as an immigrant, you know, I was 24 years old when I left uh, my hometown. I grew up in a small town called Belgam in Southern India. Uh, $20 in my pocket and didn't know anybody in America. Uh, I came here because I wanted to help my family overcome poverty and uh, help them. And so I came here, but I had a master's degree in chemistry and I got a PhD in chemistry um, you know, they, they told me it's going to be cold in America. So when it's cold, we wear a sweater. So I wore my sweater and came to New York and it was minus 10 degrees. Uh, and I was uh, freezing in my sweater. Um, but, uh, you know, got my degree. Then I started a small business, grew that business, became a serial entrepreneur, creating jobs here in America. And then uh, I wanted to give back to the society. I felt that... Uh, America being the land of opportunity has given me so much. And my focus was, what am I going to do, give back? Because I saw, even though I came from a third world country, I saw here in Detroit, families struggling, waters being turned off, homes being foreclosed. And I felt that uh, uh, I need to go help others. Uh, and th with that thought, I decided to get into public service, ran for governor, that didn't work, but I, uh, got elected as a state rep. And I'm really in La Lansing working on 
laws are making uh, people's lives better, whether it is affordable health care or whether uh, you know uh, it is um, dealing with the COVID. But uh, I'm really uh, excited to be in Lansing. In terms of immigrants, in terms of uh, people that come over, um, there's just not one type of immigrants. We have uh, documented immigrants, we have undocumented immigrants, uh, scientists, uh, some immigrants don't have as much skills. Uh, you know. So I think you can't just look at immigrants with just uh, one type of, they're as multi-layered uh, as anybody else might be. And so we need to really not uh, stereotype them into something. Also, an immigrant is a survivor. So you have that survival skill in an immigrant uh, that is very powerful, uh, trying to figure a way out because they, when they came to America, they took a lot of risk uh, to come. And that survival skill is very, very important to, to, to realize. Thank you. Um, moving over to Dr. Ducat, um, how, can you speak to your work and how transnational processes of migration affect these local democracies? Sure. Um, you know, one of the things I love about uh, the what the playwright does in the beginning of the play is uh, she says, I guess they want them to tell the beginning of the story. And they say, I don't know where to start. And it really struck me when um, the character Naja says, um, begin in the middle on the border, on the crossing, begin in the place in between. And so much of what my work looks like is, you know, I don't, I don't study the end or the beginning or even the middle. Um, folks like me who think about transnational migration don't conceptualize migration as having a starting point and you leave your country and you put a, you know, you put all your stuff in your suitcase and you get on the boat or the plane or you cross a desert and then you arrive somewhere and here is the beginning of your assimilation or your integration process. Um, in fact, we sort of think that's nonsense. Right? <laughs> it is a fluid, dynamic process. People don't stop being where they're from, uh, maintaining loyalties, connections, passions, um, trauma, suffering, right? All that is it is meant to be a human is part of that journey. And it is not one that just has a starting and a stopping point. So I really loved the way that um, Kelly, you and your crew and the actors and actresses really picked up on this idea of like, there was so much tension. And that to me really captures so much of what is fundamental about most immigrants' experiences, or at least the ones that I talk to and interview and, and learn from. Um, on that point, I think we see so in the play, this idea of home as having lots of moving parts. Sometimes home is in a suitcase, right? Sometimes home is in the curry, uh, home is in the conversations, home are in the memories, they're embedded in, in you know, the sounds and smells of what it means to be a human. And for immigrants that have trespassed so much, not just borders <laughs> um, and politics and all of that, um, so much is all the stuff we all connect to, regardless of whether we're like uh, Representative Thanadar and have immigration stories of our own, or like you're my, you know, you're my mother, who's Choctaw Cherokee, who has a different kind of immigration story out of, you know, the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. That is what it means to be a human, or these kinds of tribulations and those connections. So whether you, you know, are from here <laughs> and you move up here <laughs> um, or whatever it is, I'm just learning this moving to Michigan. That's how we, you guys do things here. Um, you know, in my, in my work, um, I'm, migrants are telling me the stories of how they're like uh, Representative Thanadar. They came here to make money, to send it home, to feed children, to clothe them, to try and get them out of one ranchito to another. I study Mexican migration. And what happens along the way is the stuff that I study, the unintended consequences of migrants who have been able to trespass borders, get a job, uh, everything from being, you know, the CEO of a Silicon Valley empire to a dishwasher in, you know, a restaurant in Mexican town. And they're sending this money home and it's that connection, but that connection has power. 
it has voice. And part of what my book looks at is the ways in which that money um, is, you know, one, one US dollar means a lot more um, in, in Mexico or in India or in Bangladesh, uh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, right, we can go on and on. Um, and so the amplification of those resources can completely change villages. They can provide electricity, schools, health clinics, uh, potable water, you name it. But it also gives, I mean, money is power. Material resources fundamentally change who has access to use political voice. And so migrants who send the money home can actually transform the power dynamic where local representatives are now trying to work in public-private partnerships with migrants because they've have come to rely on those remittance dollars uh, to fund things that their local budgets or their state budgets or sometimes even their national budgets can't do. Keep in mind, remittances account for over $650 billion worldwide. $400 billion of those dollars go directly to, to what we label as developing countries. And so the transformative potential of these resources that people are crossing deserts to send home not only comes from a pace of love, but the unintended conse consequence is that it creates power. Absolutely, thank you. Um, and then Sabrina, moving over to you. Um, I wanted to ask you about how the law impacts experiences of migration and victims of human trafficking, and, excuse me, human trafficking in particular, because as we know, one of the show themes is immigration, but another big one is human trafficking. Um, so I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Sure. So I think what one of the one of the many things this play does really beautifully is illustrates how dynamics of conflict and displacement give rise to vulnerability. And in fact, many of the people who are most affected by those dynamics are the people who are the most marginalized and most vulnerable to begin with, right? Our protagonist is a, a, a young person and we know that um, young people are a growing number of people who are seeking protection here in the United States. That is something that the law can do. Um, the law can offer protection, but, uh, and it does so in many different forms. Um, some of the ones are the ones that I, I work in, right, that, that we're trying to get for our clients, asylum or uh, special protection for juveniles, um, certain visas that uh, serve victims of trafficking or victims of certain crimes. But where the law doesn't protect, I'd say this as a lawyer, but I do believe the law does real violence because it creates additional dynamics of marginalization. And I think that's what we see, like in the absence of legal options, we see people making increasingly dangerous journeys in order to arrive here in the United States, um, many of which are, are powerfully illustrated in the play. Um, and these are the scenarios in which you're likely to see trafficking because people are willing to take really extraordinary risks um, to escape terrible situations and, um, and they hold on. Maybe they don't complain about an employer um, where there is harassment or abuse because they're worried about not only how they're going to survive if they lose that opportunity, but also they have, you know, if, if their immigration status is um, not a regular one, if they're undocumented or don't have permission to work, um, they know that the employer has law enforcement on their side and can, um, can um, have them removed from the country and they'll have to give up everything. So um, really it's interesting, the law has a really marginalizing force. And I think it's one of the, the amazing things that the play does is ask us all to bear witness to what happens um, to people who don't have protection and, um, and ask ourselves, is there something we can do to make the country more welcoming, more safe, more inclusive so that uh, people don't have to continue to experience danger once they arrive here in the United States. Thank you. Um, with the last few minutes that we have, I'd love to open the floor for us to talk about how themes from the show are present in Michigan um, with 
problems and issues facing immigrants in Michigan today, and then also what we'd like the audience to learn from this show, what the takeaway we would hope for would be, and then how people can help. Because as we know, um, the show does a great job of not placing itself in any one particularly U.S. city, because this is an issue that affects all all cities in the United States, and Michigan in particular being so near an international border, there is um, a lot of um, relevance in this work to the state that we live in. So the floor is open. <laughs> oh, Shri, I think you're on mute. One of the uh, uh, concerns, and you know, the immigrant is always trying uh, his or her best to be accepted and become part of the mainstream. Uh, so it's very uh, interesting dynamics while you are launching and missing some of the uh, aspects uh, of the fa sometimes family, I left all of my family behind. So the culture, the family, the food, the, all of that you're missing. At the same time, you're in a new environment that you have adapted as your new home and you want to be accepted and you don't want to be treated as somebody foreign, somebody different. And there's that constant struggle uh, uh, in my mind and on top of that, for at least some of the immigrants, there is that fear that someday somebody's going to come and get you and throw you right back to where you came from. And that's the fear that every day you live with. Um, I think um, as far as different topics and how I see them here in Michigan, um, Michigan, and when I've lived in different areas, different states and coasts and whatnot, people don't realize how segregated Michigan is, um, how our communities do not cross lines, how our churches, our grocery stores, pharmacies, we schools, we are completely segregated. Um, and so I'm hoping that through this piece, through other theater and artistic pieces, we start to engage in more dialogue and community and build that community and conversation with each other so that we can blend more. Um, because I think right now, everyone, especially the, the immigrant community here in Michigan, feels alone. But when you realize that you're not alone, um, that there are many of us who are fighting for justice, who want, you know, these things that should be just basic parts of humanity and that we outnumber the people who are keeping those things away from us, um, that we have power. Um, and so, uh, and with that power, we have to activate it. And that's where registering to vote, um, signing petitions, because if our vote didn't matter, they wouldn't work so hard to take it away from us. Um, and so, you have a team that you're not alone. And even if your blood family is back home, like we said before, you've got cousins here. Um, we're, we're cousins, we're family, we're all immigrants in this great country. Um, so, you know, nobody's alone. We're all here. We all have experienced this journey and Anand's journey similarly and in different ways. Um, and I hope that we here in Michigan can kind of start to speak up and and change the nonsense that we, we're seeing. You know, <laughs> um, just the louder voices aren't always the the right voices. Um, and so we need those of us who do have the right things to say to continue to speak up and and let our voices and our stories be heard and told. To that end, I would add that there, uh, so Representative Senator is working very hard for us in Lansing, and there's a number of ways that people can actually speak up in favor of bills that are going to, that offer protection. There are things pending in front of the legislature in Michigan right now that would protect immigrant workers and that would um, also end um, or allow localities to break with collaboration with um, law, between law enforcement and uh, and uh, ICE. And so these are huge ways that we can make our communities um, safer and more welcoming and also, frankly, in, encourage community collaboration with law enforcement in, in positive ways and protective ways. 
Um, and um, to that end, please do look out for a bill that gets introduced on the regular, which is uh, related to the right for immigrants, all immigrants to have access to state driver's licenses and IDs. Because mm -hmm. right now, this is how people yes. get their kids to school. It's how they get to work. Um, it's virtually yes. impossible to do here in Michigan without a vehicle. And um, it puts people at risk every single day. This is something that you can speak up about. It will have a tremendous difference in the lives of so many people. I'm yeah. on it. Yeah, I think that's absolutely paramount. Um, I'll shout out the ACLU of Michigan. Um, Sabrina knows that I'm uh, a huge fan of a report that just came out, 100 mile border. As you know, the state of Michigan is within 100 miles of an international border. Um, uh, sort of, right? They, they play with the definitions a little bit, um, whether some parts of it are actually international shoreline. But what this does is it allows ICE to um, basically have the entire state and parts of Ohio be their interior jurisdiction to police the interior through, uh, you know, roving patrol units um, and to, uh, you know, they are now being called on into many situations in which the Michigan State Police um, are pulling people over for traffic stops and then calling in ICE um, in order to provide translational services um, and to check ID because Michigan used to have, it, if this is my understanding, please correct me if I'm wrong, but Michigan used to allow driver's license before that was then done away with. And so um, states like California and, and other states have, have brought this up because if you can identify yourself and uh, the law enforcement that you're coming into contact with can identify you with driver's license, that's the end of the stop. Right, that, that's it. Then you go about your merry way. You pay your traffic ticket if if there was you know just cause for your uh, for your being stopped in the first place. And so it's these very what seems like a minor thing um, completely transform uh, the power of our police force to protect and serve, which is what what we hope and ask that they do. Um, I'll say um, everyone should read that report. It really is quite chilling. Um, if you want to know what's going on in Michigan. Um, that's going to tell you, um, and, and you may not like what you see, and then you can do all of the things that everyone's been saying on the panel that, that we should be doing. But the other thing I would say is that, um, you know, it takes a village. Um, it's a multi-pronged approach that we need in order to, uh, protect and honor, um, those who are, uh, as what Hiroshi Motomura, a, a very thoughtful professor at UCLA law calls Americans in waiting, right? These are the chosen few, right, who uh, have come here through trial, through tribulation to to be American, maybe not even to naturalize and to become a citizen, but in, in many ways will never feel like they belong even after they naturalize and become citizens because they're non-white, um, because mm -hmm. of the, uh, you know, consequences of uh, the vitriol and xenophobia and nativism we hear at every corner. And so it's our job as neighbors right, um, to, to be the voice that, that those who don't feel comfortable um, and safe, right, to, to speak their mind and tell their stories. I see it as my job now, even though I'm in academia, to tell those stories, um, to make sure that we remind people that these are human beings that love, that love their children, that love their neighbors, right? They're no different than us. They just came from somewhere else first. They were just born somewhere else. And we were just the lucky few that happened to be born in the United States. And so I think if you can start from that place of empathy um, to, to identify what is, what is common about our stories and to celebrate what is different, then everything is better. Everything is better. Um, but I think you have to start from the place of empathy and you can only empathize when you read and listen to a non-story and others like it that you find a thousand different ways to tell these stories, art, music, literature, photography, public murals, spoken word, performative arts, everything, you know, academic writing, everything we can do, dance, to tell these stories is what's going to rehumanize a population whose hearts and souls have, have been momentarily, I hope, forgotten. Absolutely. Um, that, I just wanted to say, I, I that was an incredible, um, in, incredible sharing of knowledge on this panel. This this has been an amazing learning experience for me. 
and I uh, just wanted to, to, to thank, you, thank you all. And, and in that spirit of it taking a village and also in the spirit of what Lauren and all of you really have suggested as, as a multi-pronged approach, I hope that this is the beginning of, of an efflorescence of artistic political partnerships um, because together, you know, working in the space of beauty, working in the space of empathy um, and working in the space of metaphor, which is sort of that fundamental in, in between space that we've been talking about, there is a really incredible potential. So I think, thank you to you all. Thank you to Emily and I'll, I'll hand it back to you for, for a closing. I just wanted to thank all of you one more time for joining for this panel. This has been amazing to listen to, and um, it's been great to hear all of your thoughts, not only on the show, but also on how the show is impacting us in Michigan right now. And thank you also to the audience that stuck around. I hope that you learned something, and I hope that you feel inspired to take some of the actions that um, the people on this panel discussed earlier and really just help come from that place of empathy and help make change in our state. So thank you again. Bye. <laughs>